Native ethnicity and race, and I just wanted to welcome you to this exciting panel called Decolonizing History, Gender, Region, Slavery. We have um, three important scholars working on this uh, topic, and I um, had, uh, um, I sent out a prompt, but this is also a, a continuation or a, a part of an ongoing conversation that was initiated at uh, UC Santa Cruz, also called Gender, Region, Slavery. And um, just as a, um, some of the questions that we have asked is, you know, how, uh, what, how we would think about regional, um, regional histories of slavery differently if we foregrounded gender in particular, and um, how we might think of um, the, the, these three key terms, gender, region, slavery, and how it, uh, some articulation of the three terms would allow us to think differently about a whole set of issues um, such as global processes of social reproduction, processes of historical transmission, narrative, change, and so forth. How might an interrogation of gender and region shift our understanding of the life forms, modalities, histories, and afterlives of slavery? And how might these different understandings of the continuing past shape our thinking about the global present? Now, I send this prompt to all of our scholars, but of course they're doing their own work, and I hope that at least in the very, that I hope that some of this will be addressed, There's, but we will um, hopefully have a discussion in which some of these um, questions will be discussed. So I'm just going to introduce the speakers in the order that they're going to speak, and each of them will give um, a presentation, and then we'll give them a little time to perhaps ask questions of each other, and then open it up, okay? And I think, um, if you have titles for your presentations, maybe you can just tell them because I forgot to put them down here. <laughs> so, Anjali Arundekar, our first speaker, is Associate Professor of Feminist Studies at the University of California, Santa Cruz. Her research engages the poetics and politics of sexuality, colonialism, and historiography, with a focus on South Asia. She's the author of For the Record, On Sexuality and the Colonial Archive in India which was the winner of the Alan Bray Memorial Book Award for Best Book in Lesbian, Gay, or Queer Studies in Literature and Cultural Studies from the Modern Languages Association, or the MLA. She is also co-editor with Gita Patel, who happens to be in the room, of Area Impossible, The Geopolitics of Queer Studies. And Nefti Tadyar has a wonderful essay in there. Yeah. Don't flood me. <laughs> <laughs> she uh, is a special issue of GLQ, uh, Journal of Lesbian and Gay Studies. That was 2016. Do check it out. I think it's a, one of the most um, it's one of the most um, downloaded or, and popular um, special issues of the GLQ recently. And her current book project is called Abundance on Sexuality and Historiography, which grows out of her interest in the figurations of sexuality, ethics, and collectivity in colonial British and Portuguese India. Our second speaker is Jessica Marie Johnson, who is an assistant professor in the Center for Africana Studies and the Department of History at the Johns Hopkins University. Um, professor Johnson is a historian of Atlantic slavery and uh, the Atlantic African diaspora, and she is the author of Practicing Freedom, Black Women, Intimacy, and Kinship in New Orleans, Atlantic World, which is um, under contract with the University of Pennsylvania Press. Um, She's also co-editor of a special issue of the Black Scholar book called Black Code with uh, Dr. Mark Anthony Neal. And she's the recipient of research fellowships, awards from various foundations, including the Woodrow Wilson Foundation, Library Company of Philadelphia, the Gilder Lehrman Institute, um, the Richard Civil Era War Center, and the Africana Research Center at the Pennsylvania State University. She, uh, uh, Jessica Johnson's also a digital humanist and uh, she is the founder of Afri African Diaspora PhD.com, co-organizer of the Queering Slavery Working Group with Dr. Vanessa Holden, and a member of the Latinagrex Project, and a digital alchemist at the Center for Solutions to Online Violence. I want to take your class. <laughs> <laughs> and finally, our, uh, our, our last speaker is Tatiana Sejas, is the Associate Professor of History at Pennsylvania State University, she received her PhD from Yale in 2009. Her first monograph, Asian Slaves in Colonial Mexico from Chinos to Indians, uh, won the Berkshire Conference Book Prize for 2014. <coughs> um, she is also the co-author of Spanish Dollars and Sister Republics, The Money That Made Mexico and the United States, and the co-editor of Victors and Vanquished Spanish and Nahua Views of the Fall of the Mexica, of the Mexica Empire. 
um, and she is co-book review editor for the Hispanic American Historical Review. So um, please help me welcome our three speakers. Light is a little homophobic, fluorescent lighting has not been. <laughs> <laughs> I'll live with it anyway. Um, uh, so the, the talk I'm going to give is, is part of the coda of my book, and it also draws from an essay I wrote for a special issue on slavery in the archive, which was came out um, in History of the Present, which is a journal uh, around historiography. And, and um, so the images are really not um, <coughs> ones that I'll be talking about much, but it's just to give you a sense of the archive that I work with that you have some engagement with text as image, and I'll say something about that along. So my talk is called Make Believe, Sexuality, Slavery, South Asia. As emergent archival forms push against and or record the violence of slavery's past, our panel here today is asked to consider anew the persistent failure of such efforts and the challenging of decolonizing such recuperative efforts. Now central to such concerns is the recovery of an archive of slavery that continually eludes any attempts at a redemptive historiography. As the editors of a recent social text special issue on the question of recovery and slavery note, the limits of recovery in the field of Atlantic slavery and freedom have reshaped the very parameters of historical debate and methods. Indeed, nearly every theoretical account of Atlantic slavery stages the historiography of slavery as the place where absence and archive meet. A similar reading of archival loss, paucity, and erasure even animates scholarships that challenges the foundationalism of Atlantic slavery as the origin story for the African diaspora. Now, if absence is the archival norm for Atlantic studies, it is clear that histories of slavery in South Asia perform uneasily within such a model. As Indrani Chatterjee has persuasively argued, a remarkable range of genres of slavery existed over a thousand years of South Asian history, ranging from enslaved female performers in the 17th century, alongside Arab merchants who delivered slave soldiers to buyers on the Deccan Plateau. Even as debates in Atlantic histories shift between the study of slavery as property to the study of slavery as an ontology of alienation and violence, Pache, for example, the work of Orlando Patterson, Indrani Chatterjee specifically draws attention to pre-colonial Buddhist and Hindu materials that locate slaves within a larger category of wealth in people, demarcating intimate kin-making structures such as the family as key archival sources of slave labor and civility. Now Chatterjee's emphasis on the family as an insider slave engendering site orients the family form along radically different lines than its invocation in Atlantic studies and requires close attention as it speaks to histories that continue to remain sequestered within Indian Ocean recuperation of slave histories. So for example, when Sadia Hartman, who's one of the more cited figures in this field, writes, the most universal definition of the slave, quote, is a stranger, torn from kin and community, exiled from one's country, dishonored and violated. The slave defines the position of the outsider, end quote. For, such, for Hartman and others, the slave is a kinless figuration. But in the case of South Asia, we must necessarily ask how histories of insider slaves function within and supplement such a cosmos. Within such histories of the family, often marginalized by the Atlantic Ocean plantation model of analysis, slavery in South Asia appears open to historical change, where over time descendants of slaves morphed into other categories of recognition, rarely through any formal process of manumission or abolition. 
Now, let me be clear. My turn to these variegated histories of South Asia, of slavery in South Asia, is not intended to vulgarly suggest that a proliferation of slave genres <coughs> necessarily yields a more robust availability of archives. Such an observation would merely literalize archival presence as a matter of found records and histories without an understanding of the dialectics of absence and presence that undergird such histories. Rather, my brief meditation today summons the question that lies embedded within such a coupling. What might an archive of slavery look like unmoored from its attachment to absence? I want to set the two terms, slavery and archive, both alongside and athwart one another to stage a very different story. One that seeks to discover what each of its terms might do to the other without assuming a position of negation from the outset. Simply put, if we preserve archival loss and or absence as the very marker of slave histories, how does such a gesture equally preserve a certain geopolitical distance from other slave forms within which such histories might otherwise be seen to collaborate? Now, to orient readers to this different story, I want to first note that there is no authentic South Asian history of slavery operational here. On the contrary, I'm more interested in the contested nature of what constitutes the archive of slavery within and between Atlantic and Indian Ocean networks. The entelechy of an archive of slavery, therefore, lies less in its recovery and more in its ability to manifest and materialize differentiated histories of rule. What matters most is not whether you recover such an archive or even how well you fail to recover it, but rather that its idea exists at all. Now, two impulses are central here. One that traces the mobilization of the tame slavery by intelligentsia in South Asia to describe the condition of colonized peoples in general, leading to the ready assimilation of all categories of impressed indentured and exploited laborers into the category of slavery. The other is the one that seeks to understand the identificatory network that undergirds most histories of slavery. Slaves existed here and elsewhere, a structural affiliation that precludes a closer understanding of the remarkable range and life forms of and under slavery within South Asian history. So one way I could have begun this talk was to say that more slaves cross the Indian Ocean than the Atlantic Ocean. That would be a structural affiliation model to say, look, there were slaves in India, there are slaves in Africa, there are slaves in, in uh, the Americas, etc. That's the model I'm trying to get out of, right? So thus, even as it is critical that we remind ourselves that slavery was inside of other oceanic exchanges in ways that did not always echo the economic and affected models of plantations, it is equally urgent that we not recuperate yet another stable history of slavery through its lost Asiatic form. The Schomburg Center for Research in Black Culture, which most of you know because it's here in New York's well-received 2013 exhibition, Africans in India, from slaves to generals and rulers, for example, extends histories of slavery through its focus on the success of African slaves in the subcontinent. Yet such exhibitions, which are extremely successful, continually suture histories of slavery primarily to the black and or African body. Of significance here is that this exhibition has also become a carefully touted exemplar within India as well, serving as a telling alibi for the selective past of slavery that Indians have chosen to forget or erase. Slavery is once again safely coupled primarily with the idea of an outsider Africa, sanctioning a strategic disavowal of its simultaneous insider history within South Asia. Now, in what follows, I want to turn to a small history of sexuality and slavery in Portuguese India to proffer a different kind of archival hermeneutics. After all, marginality and loss, paucity and disenfranchisement are equally the hermeneutical forms that found histories of sexuality. The missing amphora of sexuality, particularly in South Asia, is rec recovered from the archival detritus of hegemonic histories of colonialism and nationalism and showcased within more liberatory narratives of reform and rights. Um, 
And I'm going to move to um, a location which I will show you. There you go. Okay. Now, tropes of loss especially abound in queer historiographical work where sexualities, falsely pathologized pasts and archives are recuperated and reinstated as places of sanctuary, jouissance, rather than despair. Now, to fix sexuality primarily within such an arbitrary arsenal of loss is to refuse alternative histories of emergence. Now, I want to couple these lost and found histories of sexuality and slavery and ruminate instead on a more imaginative historiographical landscape full of intrepid archive and acts of invention. Now, the title of my talk, Make Believe, draws precisely attention to the telling tales of historical writing in the Foucauldian sense of exposure, confession, revelation, and the necessary fictions, hermeneutic, aesthetic, economic, that inevitably authorize any such summoning of histories of sexuality and slavery. What I want to do today, and I'm going to move to this anon, is to proffer a different sideline for the consumptions of our remains, of times past, to think of a way to sit with histories of sexuality and slavery that bypass lineages of reproduction or value, of loss or absence. My aims, overly ambitious as they may seem for such a brief talk, are threefold. To call attention to the displacement of slave pasts within histories of sexuality that are themselves routinely displaced. To locate those displacements in an itinerant archive of profit and pleasure. And to open a dialogue between the fields of area studies and sexuality studies within an eye to understanding how histories of slavery can reshape, even devastate, those field formations. Now, my third section is called Iterant Sex, Iterant Slave. Now, this map is a 19th century map of the Bombay presidency, which was controlled by British India. There is a small area right here, which is Goa, which you know as a holiday vacation, but was colonized by the Portuguese for 451 years. India was liberated, British India was liberated in 1947. Portuguese India was not liberated in 1961. I'm going to talk about that little bit of Portuguese India, right? So keep that in mind as we move forward. I usually don't show maps, but even South Asians don't know this history. So that's the only reason why I'm doing the very didactic thing. But before we get to Portuguese India, I want to set up the idea of slavery within the South Asian context. What happened to the Vedic Dasi and or slave? Dasi is a Sanskrit word for slavery demanded Uma Chakravarti in a timely invocation in an essay that has now become canonical fodder for most feminists working on sexuality and historiography in South Asia. For Chakravarti, the transition of the woman question, the perennial bugbear of feminist efforts, from the colonial to the post-colonial, revolved problematically around the persistence of Vedic genealogies around the role of women and men and the instrumentalization of those genealogies. The essay, which is a very, very prominent essay, depicts the stabilization of an Aryan past by Orientalist scholars such as Max Muller and by native writers such as Jadunath Sarkar, all coinciding with a 19th century focus on the Vedas, which are the holy, one of the holy texts of Hinduism, as a source for a pure pre-colonial past. Some cherished truths, argued Chakravarti, emerge from these 19th century debates that attempted to manhandle, as it were, the woman question. One, the golden age of women, we are told, was the Vedic period, as Aryan women progenitors of upper caste humanity and the deserving subjects of historical recovery. Second, the strategic disappearance of her kin in servitude, the Vedic Dasi, the Vedic slave, enslaved by the Aryan woman and her kind. Even as Chakravarti does not narrate the story of that missing Vedic slave, per se, her essay reminds us of this figural disappearance, functioning as a rallying call for a feminist history of caste and slavery, a history when it comes to this disappeared Vedic Dasi still remains to be written. Now, as a scholar who works on histories of sexuality in South Asia, I have always in equal measure been galvanized and perplexed by Chakravarti's call for the search and rescue of this Vedic slave, this Dasi, a call quoted ad nauseum, but ironically rarely connected 
to histories of slavery in South Asia. The Vedic Dasi is somewhere in the pre-colonial past. We embrace her as feminist, but we don't really want to know much more about her. Now, after all, what does it mean to be a Dasi, a subject object of enslavement, and what do the terms of that enslavement entail? Given the proliferation of slavery, as I said, as a generic catch-all in South Asia to describe the subjugation of gendered bodies, it becomes even more important to pass out the historical lineages of Chakravati's slave and the archival forms through which she is translated and accrued as feminist capital. Of significance here is that such invocations of foundational histories of slavery, where is this lost Darcy, are crucially attentive to the archival economies of loss, paucity, and devaluation. Now, my current work, from which I will draw on, traces the emergence of Devadasis, marked descendants of that Vedic Dasi, that slave. Deva, as uh, Devadasi, is a pan-Indian term taken from Sanskrit, literally meaning a slave, Dasi, of a god, Deva, and often rendered falsely interchangeable with archival embodiments of sex worker, courtesan, prostitute. I'm writing about the 18th, 19th century, but my dear colleague and friend Lucinda Ramberg has written a wonderful book on contemporary figurations of Devadasis, if you're interested. It's called Given to the Goddess, so I urge you to read that. Now, available configurations of Devadasi histories garner their archival value through charting a narrative teleology from bondage to freedom, clearly derivative of set mythologies of slavery from the Atlantic Ocean model. Devadasis are rescued from their doomed enslavement to sexuality and reconstituted in more redemptive contexts such as religion and the arts. The emphasis here in thinking of the Devadasi or the Vedic Dasi, as Uma Chakravarti reminds us, speaks instead to slavery's multiple life forms and histories. Let me say more what I mean. Now, my book engages the complex graphings of empire as they mark the movements of a prominent community of Devadasis, the Gomantak Maratha Samaj. Gomantak means from Goa, Maratha is a general term which can be used to define region or caste. Samaj means collectivity. As these Devadasis traveled back and forth between two discrepant empires, the Portuguese, which is that small place, and British India, principally in the western states of Goa and Maharashtra. Members of this diaspora, also referred to as bailaderas, you see that Uma bailadera, or Kalavans, literally carriers of art, shuffled between Portuguese and British colonial India for over 200 years, challenging European epistemologies of race and rule through their inhabitation in two discrepant empires. Tracing their roots back to early 18th century Goa, the Gomantak Maraha Samaj, I will refer to it as the Samaj, is a Dalit and or other backward caste community and was established as a formal organization in 1927 and 1929 in the western states of Goa, Karnataka, and Maharashtra. It officially became a charitable institution in 1936. Now, the Samaj continues its activities to this day and has from its inception maintained a community of 10,000 to 50,000 registered members. Now, available historical records, this image is from the 1890s, provide a clear history of enslavement and labor by suggesting that these Devadasis were brought to Goa by the migration of Saraswat upper caste Brahmins who came in search of fertile lands and sustenance. Within such, um, within such accounts, Devadasis were primarily chattel, enslaved workers whose services shifted into regimes of sex and art after their migration into foreign lands. Such a shift is reflected, for example, in the official notation of the existence of Devadasis as a social group within the 1904 census of Goa. So this image is from 1904, and it is attached to the census of Goa. And this woman is referred to as a Adha Bhakti, which literally means half slave. The 1904 census Goa also records Devadasis who were bhandis, slaves, which could be a corruption of many terms. Adha bhakti could also be a cor corruption of adha bhakti, which is another term that circulated around that time. Terms that eventually yield to more of amorphous terms, such as bailadera, kalavant, etc. Right? 
Now, let me be clear that in the past decade or so, there has been significant work done on Indo-Portuguese histories of slavery that focus again on African bodies in Goa, either in the guise of African soldiers brought to fight wars or the movement of Indian bodies, specifically Goan fishermen who crossed the Indian Ocean to places like Mozambique. Yet as mentioned earlier, such trajectories still focus on an outsider-insider understanding of histories of slavery. Now, very important to this community that I'm going to talk about is that their own archives are efflorescent and abundant, right? Remember, I started by saying, what happens if we unmoor ourselves from the attachment to loss? That is the joint that brings slavery and archive together. So for example, this is from the 1929, um, it's the rule book uh, of the Samaj, it's from their, at the first page of their rule book, and it's uh, called the Niyambal, which basically means the rule book. So, and you see this very odd quotation, which is from Tennyson. It's, it's a random thing, but it's about uh, heralding a certain kind of movement. I'm going to show you a lot of images from their archive because I want you to understand how massive it is and how counterintuitive it is for us to encounter such abundance, right? And yet where the abundance leads us will be quite surprising. Now the Samaj, as I've written about in many places, has maintained a continuous and copious archive since its inception in 1929. Unlike more received histories of Devadasis and or of slavery in South Asia that lament the disappearance of their histories, the history of the Samaj offers no tea loss of loss and recovery. <coughs> Instead, the Samaj, from its inception, has maintained a continuous, copious, and accessible archive of its own emergence, embracing rather than disavowing its past and present attachments to sexuality. The Samaj's archives, which are housed in Paraji, which is in Goa, and Bombay, which is in the state of Maharashtra, constitute an efflorescence of information in Marathi, Kokani, Portuguese, and Kannada, ranging from minutes of meetings, journals, newsletters, private correspondences, all filled with details of the daily exigencies and crises that concern this community. I've been working in this archive for over 12 years. I've only read about 50% of it. Now, this is an image from a uh, journal that is published to this day. It's called the Samaj Sudharak. Samaj means collectivity. Sudharak means improvement, progress. And every image of the, of the journal has a variation of this image, where you have a woman who's ostensibly the Devadasi kicking Rudy, or which could be tradition or the stranglehold of, of uh, enslavement, the term changes. What she's kicking changes over time. But the first image, which I couldn't reproduce, literally says kicking away enslavement. And it's dated at the time when the women were categorized as bandis, as slaves. So this archive has been around since the, the late 1890s. This is a more uh, recent issue from 1933, for those of you who can read Dave Nagri. Now, Preference in these archives is given, ironically, to the genre of fiction rather than veracity genres. Such efflorescence appears startling, almost jarring, pushing against our archival expectations of absence and erasure. The Samaj archives, as I said, are housed in open collections and are available for public consumption. Any one of you could walk in there and have a look and will be given access. In fact, the Samaj's incitement to archive is only surpassed by its startling disinterest in the preservation and circulation of the very materials it continually produces. A researcher's even curious visitor's visit was met with relative ease. To this day, new materials continue to enter the Samaj archives with little effort being expended to either digitalize, which I'm happy to talk about, or republish older, more fragile materials. Far from coupling archival accumulation with straightforward visibility, the Samaj's story challenges our historical sense of reading. Bypassing the demands for recuperation, the Samaj's archive stubbornly demand readings that unsettle the foundational link between historical utility and archival preservation. So this is the only biography that's present, autobi, which is called Me Kon, Who Am I? And the biography is based on an event that the author staged a revolt that he staged in order to get benefits from the Portuguese state, because he understood that without a revolt, they wouldn't be recognized as a community, right? So the irony is that the, the autobiography is based on a fiction that is, can be found in the archives as a, quote, real event, right? Uh, now, a second extraordinary feature of the Samaj, I'm almost done, uh, is, con is a concerted effort to refuse reproductive futurity 
through proprietary kinship structures. As Devadasis, the Samaj members were seen as distinct from the category of prostitutes, I'm gonna end with this, by the Portuguese colonial state, these women maintained <coughs> coercive and non-coercive relationships with Brahmin upper caste men and women. As children of such unions were rarely recognized as legitimate heirs to their father's caste status, a variety of creative forms of kinship were developed to survive and prosper. In some cases, the children took on their father's caste names, their upper caste names without consent, such that we have Samaj members running around all over India with upper caste names who are distinctly not upper caste. While these members are not Brahmin, the acquisition of Brahmin names, surnames, has created sufficient confusion within normative kinship structures. Given the primacy of blood and laws of primogenitor, such slides of caste, if you will, are more than efforts at upward mobility. Rather, they gesture to an astute anticipation of sexuality's compensatory economies, entangled as they are within regimes of profit and pleasure. Now, I want to end with an archival fragment. Contained within these archives are over 50 documents called Kharid Patra, literally letters of sale, from colonial Goa and Bombay that note the relationship of a Devadasi, uh, as we know what that means, with one <coughs> or two yajmans, patrons and or masters, dated between 1906 to 27, right? So 50 letters of sale. What is curious about such letters of sale is that they bypass the subject property nexus that is the staple form of engaging histories of slavery. Rather, the letters speak to the Devadasi's worth, mulya, in a language of capitalization that requires the master to provide a guarantee, a hawala or a hami, as part of the sale, the kharib. Thus, for example, one Vimal Shirodkar, age 16, is sold to Sushil Kakorkar in 1907 with a guarantee that he will provide independent lodging and board for her and any offscrim she has and promise her a monthly stipend of rupees 50. Vimal's value is in turn valued over and over again through a capacity to speak many tongues and moods to be loyal and lustful. The quotation is Bhasha Ani Shahanpan, Nishta Ani Lalsa. Each letter highlights a kala talent that needs to be nurtured and freed through the exchange with the master, the yajman. No mention is made of how such revenue is accrued. Now, I have seen those letters of sale, but I'm not allowed to reproduce them. I am allowed to reproduce this, which is 43 years later. This, I don't know how many of you can read Portuguese. That's in Portuguese. This is in Kokani Marathi, right? 43 years later, the same Vimal from 1907, who was sold for 50 rupees, appears again in 1950, amidst the archival fragments of the same Samaj, this time in the context of a will, Mrityu Patra, left by Vimal Shirodkar, a prominent Goan Devadasi from Margao, Goa. The will, written both in Portuguese Marathi, which is required, bypasses the conventional lineages of inheritance. Instead, Vimal uses the form of the will to chart her own history and that of her community. Spread over 10 pages, the will systematically names Vimal's many <coughs> masters, yajmans, and lists the multiple properties and related acquisitions acquired through certain relationships. Each property, we are told, has been procured through a separate bill of sale, a separate karit patra, and through each such sale, Vimal writes, her mulya, her value increases. And as her mulya grows, Vimal writes with a clear sense of irony, so does her ability to karib, buy her own property. Her kin, Maza Parivar, my family, she writes, lies in her network of sales, properties spread through Goa. She provides specific geographical details of this very, very long will, sowing seeds of profit and pleasure. It is only at the very end of this literate and iterant letter that you find, if you will, her final bill of sale, that we are told cryptically that Vimal's three daughters should receive equal share. The final line of the will reads, Maze mulya, maze now. My value, my name. Okay. Now to conclude, there's obviously a lot more to say about these materials. I just wanted to give you a taste of them to encourage you to go look at them. There's obviously much more to say about these Dasis and histories of slavery, but I wanted you to leave you with this rich and vibrant historical excerpt of one iterant collectivity. Let me conclude by returning to the question I began with. 
How do histories of sexuality constitute robust histories of slavery? And what critical lessons are to be learned? To do so is not to disengage from the provocations of archival recovery. It is more to grapple with archives of slavery that are open to sexuality's iterations, to geographical and geopolitical displacements, and reinvestments in new forms of collective belonging. The challenge here is to narrate differentiated of sla histories of slavery continually attentive to the capital and he epistemological hegemony of the Atlantic model, particularly in the late 18th and 19th century. Thus, even as it is incumbent upon us to probe slavery's recursivity through an understanding of its geopoliticized forms, it is important that we do not do so through structural resemblances, but through forms of difference and function. These are not lot histories, but archival forms that are sedimented and provide persistent lines of sight. Thank you for your patience. So our next speaker is Jessica Marie Johnson. Um, the title of my talk is uh, Bury Me in the Ocean, Decolonial Roots Through Slavery's Archive. Kind of light on my iPad. So the year 1721 marked the first documented arrival of female slaves shipped from Africa to French New Orleans. 12 of the 23 ships to make the crossing left behind enough data uh, to calculate gender ratios among their human cargo. Over the course of the entire French slave trade to Louisiana, just over a quarter of the slaves sold were female. The documented slave trade from the continent <coughs> to French Louisiana occurred between 1719 and 1730, just to give a kind of temporal space of where we're at. But the final ship landing between 1743, it's sort of an anomaly, but it does play a role in these figures and in this story. And these, this trade does not include the much less and sort of scantily documented transshipment trade uh, between the Caribbean and the Gulf Coast at this time period and any undocumented ships that might have arrived. These 23 ships are the ones that we know of. As a whole, what we can know from this truncated and um, devastating commerce is that as female slaves arrived in the colony, they did so in a short span of time and their presence shaped the colony's development. So the way we think about it, the ways that the ebb and flow of slave ships impacted the provenance local prominence and cultural presence of African women along the Gulf Coast. And on this methodology, I'm riffing off of um, Brenda Stevenson, who created um, and gives a methodology for thinking about female slave community in the US South. That said, women and girls um, receive little mention upon arrival. More than likely, most would have proceeded on to New Orleans to be sold to slave owners managing concessions or plantations located below the city at places like Chapatulas, or the tobacco plantations further north at Natchez and other places. Um, company officials, ship captains, and river workers also would have confiscated a handful of female slaves for domestic subsistence and more than likely some kind of sexual labor of their own. Africans in Louisiana, arriving in Louisiana, weren't funneled into a kind of grueling sugar complex like they were elsewhere in the Caribbean. However, part of sequitur ventrum still structured the reproduction of enslaved labor and socialized imperial desire for female flesh. So a climate of men needing, wanting, or demanding labor and companionship of all kinds, and a space where conspicuous displays of wealth included enslaved laborers and displaying enslaved wealth created a matrix of precarity and exploitation for slaves marked as female in the registers. So this is kind of the milieu that they're in. So Africans are marked as slaves by more than law and fiat, right? So their physical presence on the coast 
everybody is arriving, so we want to think through what are the ways that they are actually marked as bonded. So their physical presence on the coast as emaciated and abused new arrivals disembarking from ships, boats with bellies to play on glissant, embodied capital, the promise of more capital, um, especially if they were female, and the excessive violence required to unmake humans into captives, ungender bodies into flesh, and extract goods from particularly unforthcoming land and waterways along this particular part of the coast. In French Louisiana, two things further complicate um, enslaved females' African experience of bondage on the Gulf Coast and how we can think about it. One is the tradition passed down along the Mississippi River from Canada and the lands of the upper, what become the upper Midwest, of extracting sexual, reproductive, and agricultural labor from indigenous women through a practice of mesalliance and an indigenous slave trade that eventually crisscrossed the Gulf South. And we have folks like Barbara Krauthammer who writes about this, Alan Gallet writes about this. So that's the first. The second, that kind of complicates how we think about female slave experience in the Gulf Coast <coughs> is a history of indigenous labor appropriation exploitation in the Caribbean, of which indigenous of mainland North America found themselves thrust, thrust as early as the 1670s and as late as the 1730s when Natchez insurgents were shipped by the French from Gulf Coast, Louisiana to be sold to the islands of the Caribbean for daring to resist French planner encroachment. And if we reach further back, this second root of race and gendered exploitation is one that further unites at least two other historiographies that are normally bisected by empire. One is obvious, the sort of mainland North America history of slavery and the creation of a nation. And the other is the history of the post-1492 Caribbean, a history that begins as indigenous, but a history where enslaved African women and girls join almost immediately, so as early as 1566. The ship Santiago arrives in Puerto Rico with 77 enslaved African women and children. So all this is to say, these are quite a few threads to draw, draw on to write a history of enslaved and free women of African descent in the New World, and to consider even what those terms mean, slave, free, woman, man, African, what those might entail. And then there are those uh, enslaved who did not arrive across the Atlantic, Africans themselves who found devastating ways to be accountable to and for each other. So on a ship named Venus, which left Senegal in April of 1729 with 172 captives, including 21 women, girls, and boys, Africans organized a mass suicide en route to Louisiana. One afternoon, a month out at sea, a contingent of captives, all Wolofs, began to throw themselves overboard. Five succeeded in doing so before the crew intervened and secured the rest. And despite attempts to recover the enslaved, as one crew member described it, they all drowned, <coughs> although he threw them several poles and other things they did not at all wish to save themselves. Uh, so bury me, bury me in the ocean, Killmonger riffs. Killmonger, who we must remember, killed his lover on his way to Wakanda, but who triggered a global African diaspora in the process. The theme of this symposium is thinking about decolonizing history. It offers us an opportunity to explore what it means to dismantle and dissemble in the work we do. And we all come to this history in different kinds of ways. So some of us do this work as descendants of those who lay in the belly of the ships and lived or died there. Or we are descendants of those who did not wish to save themselves. And of course, it need not be really one or the other. It could actually perhaps possibly be both. Some of us also do this work as accomplices and conspirators of those living and dead and living dead marked as black, recognizing our relation, capital R, to each other. And again, riffing off of Glissant. Yumaira Figueroa notes in this tradition of decolonial thought, it is in the faithful witnessing of the moments of resistance, failures, deceptions, triumphs, violence, love, and small histories that one actively participates in the affirmation of other voices and the substantiation of other truths. Without this kind of recognition, histories are erased, silenced, and ultimately invalidated as human experiences. So decolonial work is the work, as I understand it, of seeing the whole, or seeing the whole, W, to riff on Rizvana Bradley, riffing on Evelyn Hammonds, and a gesture to Norbesse Phillip as well, and the black hole left by the disavowal of race and blackness in places like Canada, a framing we might be able to think about relating to um, anti-blackness in Puerto Rico as well. It's seeing that whole and encountering the dense matter of race and gendered signification as well as the ecstatic, ecstatic possibilities of blackness that once the point of toleration has passed, explodes beyond all bounds of itself in a clenching and an excruciating release that ripples and reverberates across time and space, over and beyond and above, and then winds up to do it again. So decol decolonial history, decolonizing history is a kind of care work, a wake work, and it's rarer than we'd like to admit. 
So I enter into this humbly then and want to try my hand at sort of decolonizing history through two short explorations. One is from the past, it's the story of Tzedes. The other is from the present, it's the story of a map. And one is also the story of the past, just as the other is also a story that cannot be told in the present. And maybe somewhere in this, my attempt at a somewhat truncated and disruptive narration, we might find ways to chart ourselves um, into a kind of different new future. So in 1726, John Mingo arrives in Louisiana. This is still a colony at this time. It's a part of the French Empire. He fled slavery in South Carolina. A year after arrival, he married Therese, an enslaved woman belonging to one of the nearby plantations, the Bernard Cantillon Concession. We don't know if he was a free black man in South Carolina, but in their marriage register, he declared and declares himself as free. Two years later, Mingo enters into a work contract with a white colonist named Jonathan Darby. Darby is the rector of the same concession that he has taken residence on with Therese. As a result of the contract that he affects with Darby, Mingo would be allowed to redeem Therese and any children she bore. He'd be able to free her. Redemption is a manner of freeing in French Atlantic. Once he paid the price of her value, the price of her value is about 1,500 francs, which if we think of it converted to today-ish, that's about $9,000. Through the fruits of his own labor, Mingo will be allowed to invest in and pay down the value of his wife. And in the meantime, Darby will continue to provide Therese with ruin board. So we can presume, perhaps, that Mingo, this recent arrival, had found in Therese's enslaved domicile a shelter, if not a safe place to land. Around the same time that Mingo makes his contract, he takes a position with a different slave owner on a different plantation. He agrees to work for a man named Chabonet as a commandeur, which is a slave driver. For his work, he'd be paid 300 francs a year. He'd receive 8% of the plantation produce. He'd receive a jug of brandy each month. And in addition, Chabonet agreed to hire Therese as a domestic for an additional sum of 200 francs a year. So this would be paid, same thing, to her owner, back to her original owner once her price is paid off, until her price is paid off. So on the one hand, we have Mingo, who's presenting or ascribed as black, as man, as male, who was fugitive and absconding from whatever family and community he must have known in South Carolina or in the Caribbean or the West African coast and who had to find and make a home out of reach of the spread of the plantation complex that had engulfed South Carolina by this time, and it was spreading something like a virus or a disease. And on the other hand, you have Therese, who may have recently met him, or maybe would have known him for some time. She might have been brought to Louisiana, or she was born there. She couldn't claim, though, to be free in her marriage documents. The master's, for instance, intimate knowledge of her and her kinship networks, or her lack of kin, in other words, a knowledge that would have approved via himself, other slave owners, the surveillance of the imperial apparatus of registers, slave ship manifests, militia patrols, and of course also there's the implicit and illicit suggestion made here of other kinds of carnal violence. Master's knowledge of her wouldn't allow her to claim the kind of fugitive freedom that allowed Mingo to be marked in the register as free. Whether born in Louisiana or elsewhere in the diaspora, that us may also have begun to create community and kinships of her own on the plantation she lived on, which was also in a neighborhood of outposts like New Orleans, which means essentially that she's in a space where physical movement of African and indigenous slave and free might have been scrutinized but was not uncommon. So she's in a position to create kinships and communities and family networks. And if she'd been born in Louisiana, which is possible, and again, we don't have her age, so this is what this critical fabulation is attempting to address. If she was born in Louisiana, it may have meant she knew her mother, had siblings, she may have had some connection to the enslaved around her beyond their kind of mutual degradation. She may have been baptized and have activated a kinship bond with a godfather or a godmother. She may have god siblings. She may have been part of other kinds of kinship and community formations like the collective of Mina, who held dances and met on the weekends. We just don't know for sure. What we know is that Mingo took employment, managing, whipping, punishing, and directing enslaved Africans on a plantation to set her free. And we note that S found herself with a dubious amount of choice, conscripted to labor as a domestic in a household on and all around that same plantation. We do know the danger that domestic household labor would have put her in, the kind of threat of intimate and personal physical violence that's described by a host of historians, including um, Deborah Gray White, Gloria Glimp, Tia Miles, Cynthia Hartman, whose name has also already been invoked. 
And we also know that she wouldn't have been paid um, for her own labor, that that pay would have gone to her owner, albeit it's towards her purchase price. So her story in the archive is structured so much by his, and that is both the frustration and the position of being rendered in silence and obscured that is as much about gendered states of colonial subjectivity as it is about the actual state of her gender. A year into this arrangement, in 1730, uh, Mingle complains to the Superior Council. Darby, it turns out, had made difficulties and wasn't giving him the funds that were supposed to be allotted to him. The Superior Council ends up, after some back and forth, ruling in Mingo's favor, um, noting that among other forms of restitution, that S should be restored, quotation, be restored to her husband. Now, where that S went, or was, or had been, that she should need to be restored, is something else that we just simply don't know. Amen. Hey, Satellite images of Puerto Rico at night were taken by the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration and were sent out as a tweet. The top image was taken at 2 a.m. on July 24th, 2017. The bottom image was taken at 2 a.m. on September 25th, 2017, just five days after Hurricane Maria made landfall in Puerto Rico. Pictured here, Puerto Rico is a dark mass, spots of light like stars plotting colonial and indigenous space and time. Before 1860, enslaved and free people of African descent would have filled these black, black spaces on the map. Africans would have responded with indigenous as maroons to those darkened mountains together in search of fugitive caciques, or some would have been kidnapped from plantation districts to be sold to cash poor would be slave owners in the hills who couldn't afford the prices and specie being demanded of international slave, by international slave trading merchants at the ports. Blackness in the blackened spaces hit hardest by the storm disappears here even as it saturates other images that flicker across our computer screens and news items circulated desperately and especially by Puerto Ricans in the diaspora searching for kin. <laughs> we see the black and space technology made possible slash visible and the white space called to work of outlining the new world. So we see Ponce, we see San Juan, we see the result of air and water called to life by human beings, irretrievable intervention in the environment. And we remember how it swirled into the arms of a hurricane and winds that rose to over 150 miles an hour decimated vegetation, homes, power lines, and water sources. In this map, what we don't see is the debt that was laid on the island by the 2016 signing of the Puerto Rico Oversight Management and Economic Stability Act, La Promesa, which was signed by Obama. We don't see the Jones Act signed in 1920 that in true mercantilist, colonialist form, limited shipping to the island to US ships or the police military surveillance apparatus keeping order through the night, which amounts to breaking up gathering spaces of dance and play, you know, the ones that inevitably erupt when there's only one working generator in a neighborhood, and the night is long, hot, and dark. And we don't see the 1,230 deaths from failed life support, insulin gone bad, illness, bad weather, or by choice. Some didn't want to be saved. We do not see that this 12 30 does not include death, if any, among the estimated 87,000 island residents who moved mainland. So the Suomi satellite that captured this image was launched in 20, uh, 2011. The VERS, Visible Infrared Imaging Radiometer Suite, captured this image using a whisper scanner that collects visual data one pixel at a time by reflecting light on a detector, which is basically a sensor. According to NASA, VERS detects light in a range of wavelengths from green to near infrared and uses filtering techniques to observe dim signals such as gas flares, auroras, wildfires, city lights, and reflected moonlight. One of the lead researchers converting pixels collected by birds into predictive data um, is suggesting that predictive data can be used to predict everything from hurricanes to wildfires. One of the lead researchers is Miguel O. Roman, a climate scientist at NASA, who is also Puerto Rican, who was born in San Juan, and who remarks that cultural context drives energy use, which drives when the lights stay on, and how long at night, and who is in the dark. Verse is terrible, can't I just see it? So Verse captures this. Yeah. But you can see it, you can see what normally is sort of dark would not necessarily be lit up and so 
Decolonizing history asks scholars to see the flares light makes in the dark and convert those brief flashes into signals that cross time and space. It is, as Jennifer Morgan suggests, disruptive poetics. It is, as Marisa Fuentes argues, reading along the biased grain, um, to see the woman that is in the scratches and frustration left behind by her husband and her owner is to see what colonial logics want to render invisible and is also to see the misuse of power that made a dark island possible. So in Teresa's manufacturing, her manufactured silence, I hear the labor that made one man free and the other man master, and it's hard to hear the beat or measure by which even still there may have been some element of volition in her partnership with John Mingo, but we must, so we also, I also hear that too. And in this black space on the map, I see a terrible representation of slavery's past and empire's present, which is also a fantasy of modularity and illumination, now that we can see, or we think we can see, that might satisfy us digitally, but still means we actually may miss the legacy of 1492 staring us in the face. So how do scholars of slavery account for this black space on the map, in the belly of the ship, the arm around Teresa's neck, or the five wolops at the bottom of the ocean? What of the requirement that the black feminine in the whole and in the whole be part of this discussion? And there's no verse, in other words, that can sort of knit these multiple historiographies when we think about the ways that doing the digital is also problematic in the context of these histories. There's no verse that can knit multiple historiographies, geographies, and scaffolding together for us. Our histories require our own promiscuous methodologies and cross-cultural <coughs> contexts to frame these questions of volition, violation, politics, and also of um, defiance. Thank you. And maybe our, our, our final speaker is Lachena Sejas. distant past and to a different geography than where we've been. Before I begin, thank you, Nefefi, for bringing us together. Uh, today I'll be sharing with you uh, the story of a woman named Juliana who lived in 17th century Mexico City. Her experiences, to my mind, illustrate how we <coughs> might employ the genre of historical biography to study gender, region, and slavery. Now looking at the title, uh, Bills of Sale, it points to the challenge that we face in writing about the lives of people held in bondage when the only extant written records are property documents. Before turning to Juliana, however, let me tell you a little bit about a larger project that shares a similar commitment as this series uh, to decolonizing the history of women and global slavery. So Erica Ball, uh, Terry Snyder, and I are co-editing a collection that is tentatively titled Women, Slavery, and Emancipation in the Americas which will include the biographies of over 20 women by leading scholars like my co-panelist, Jessica Johnson. The collection addresses the overlooked history of women of African descent who asserted their freedom in the Americas. It's a hemispheric history with a periodization that spans from the 16th to the turn of the 20th century our book shows that black women were agents of individual and collective emancipation in places like Nova Scotia, Mexico, Virginia, Colombia, Brazil, and myriad other places in the Americas where enslaved people from Africa and their descendants carved out a life in the shadow of slavery. So join our truth. Uh, whose photograph you see here 
is a relatively famous example of such a person. Our contributors recover the diverse routes to freedom taken by women like Chu, um, but many other women whose names would otherwise pass from history. By bringing these stories together, we aim to offer a comprehensive history of women of African descent in the Americas and to offer new interpretations of race and gender in the hemispheric context of slavery and abolition. As you can tell, one of my intellectual agendas has been to think about um, slavery, uh, the African diaspora in the Americas, from Chile to Canada. So my work as a co-editor for Women's Slavery and em Emancipation in the Americas has had me thinking a lot about historical biography, a genre of history that I am relatively new to, in my own research and writing, especially in regards to methodology and sources. So I am, by training, a social and economic historian. So a lot of my research has involved property records <coughs> and other kinds of documentation with quantifiable <coughs> data. I line up with <laughs> some of this um, Atlantic historiography. Reconstructing the lives of individuals based on this kind of source is very problematic in some ways. But I, I do see that it is a necessary challenge to overcome if we are to write about women who were enslaved while we have our bills of sale. So in the Spanish legal system, slave owners needed a notarized bill of sale to claim their property. So a bill of sale as a historical document gives you the name, the age of a person who was sold as human chattel, and the price paid for that person. What can we do with such information to affirm a person's humanity? Bills of sale certainly bear witness to the horrors of slavery, especially when you come upon them in the thousands. But to my mind, bills of sale are also a way of glimpsing into people's everyday lives. So I want to tell you about the experience of one woman based on four very short documents which I unearthed while I was doing research for my first monograph. The documents are in Mexico City's notarial archive, <coughs> which is now housed at the ex-convent of Corpus Christi. And I'm going to do the dimming of the lights thing, because I want you to imagine that all of these bills of sale and these wills are in what was once um, a convent that enclosed indigenous women. It's the only convent in uh, Mexico that was open to women of indigenous descent. So it is there in this very building, which now looks like this, that we find evidence of, of these people's experiences. Now, the first document, and I decided to quote it so that you could see the, the few words that we have to work with. Um, the first bill of sale um, is a document It's from 1636, so back in the more distant past. And I cite here a few words, um, quote, she, a China slave named Juliana, 40 years of age, more or less, with four of her children. Right? That's the identifier for the people who were going to be sold. The oldest, Ana, was 12 years old, and the youngest, Diego, was five <coughs> months old. <coughs> what do we learn from this bill of sale beyond her age? and that she's the mother of four children. Well, the word China uh, tells us that Juliana was originally from somewhere in Southeast Asia, 
possibly Luzon Island in the Philippines, or even more likely from Bengal. Um, and we find out too from the rest of this document that the transaction, the bill of sale, was between a widow, a woman by the name of Catalina de Uceta, who sold the family, the four of them, uh, to a Dominican friar for 750 pesos, which is quite a lot of money. The friar who purchased Juliana and the children resided in a monastery named San Jacinto, which is where she went to live with her children. I'm going to turn off the lights again. I want you to see this place. Maybe I'll speak with that in the background. So this is a, a photograph of San Jacinto, where <coughs> Juliana and her four children lived for about three years. So from other sources, I can tell you that this monastery served as a hospice kind of hospital for friars on their way to and returning from the Philippines. And it's a significant connection because Juliana would have traveled on the same annual fleet, the Manila Galleon, as the friars did when she was forced to make the journey to Mexico decades earlier. So in her everyday life, <coughs> she would have met people who might have been where she was once from. So looking at this, this monastery, um, it's really relatively large complex that housed hundreds of people, we might wonder what Juliana and her children spent their days doing. What kind of labor did the friars make her do? Um, and we know from the history of slavery around the world that as soon as children could walk, they performed labor for the slave owners. So it's possible that she was a domestic uh, worker. Um, the work that she had done in the previous household where she had served. Um, but many more uh, possibilities are likely as well, of course. And I think that for most of us who study gender and the history of slavery, um, the, the violation of sexual labor always at the forefront of our analysis. Um, the third document um, in this forming biography of Juliana is a confirmation of the sale that had taken place a couple of years earlier. Um, it was drawn up at the request of the friar who had taken uh, Juliana back to San Jacinto. His name was Francisco Carrero. So in it, uh, the previous slave owner, Catalina de Uceta, the widow, authenticated that she had indeed sold Juliana, who is now said to be 33, right? You notice the change from she was once 40, 40 años, to now she's 33. So the friar ne needed this kind of notarized authentication of the sale that had taken place a couple of years earlier um, as well as the original slave title because he planned to sell Juliana once again. People bought and sold slaves um, as investments. So in looking at what is what presented here in terms of information, um, we might ask, did the friar ask the previous slave owner to change her day, change her age? Um, did he ask her to make Juliana younger? Perhaps he did. It's actually very likely that he did. <coughs> As we know that enslaved women of childbearing age, below 40, were priced much higher than those who were older in accord with their potential reproductive labor. We learn too from this sales certificate that Uceta's deceased husband so the previous owner's deceased husband had first purchased Juliana back in 1619, um, which would have made it so that, say we believe <laughs> that she was 40, 
um, it would mean that you know she was an adolescent when she was first purchased. It also means that Juliana had grown up, had become an adult, had become a, a woman who bore children in the household of that previous slave owner, which would mean that the widow who sold her would have watched her children grow up. The final document is another um, bill of sale. And it tells us that the friar sold Juliana with only three of her children, right? One of the children, Magdalena, in the 1636 bill of sale, is now identified with a different name, Ana Maria. The names and the ages of the children raise so many questions. So for me, um, I was haunted by thinking about what happened to Diego, the five-month-old um, child. Um, did the little boy stay behind at the monastery? He would have been about three and a half. Or had the friars already sold him before this sale? Certain, though, that Juliana was not able to take her, her youngest to the next place where she lived. The document also introduces us to Gonzalo, another um, slave, also from Asia. He's identified as a Chino as opposed to a Negro, which would have been the derogatory term for people who were from Africa. So Chino was the signifier for people from, from Asia. So we know, too, that he is a uh, Castapali, uh, and that is likely that he spoke Pali, which is a language that is related to Sanskrit, which means that he was probably from, historically speaking, what is Siam or Burma, Myanmar, and Thailand. And we might wonder how it came to be that Gonzalo came to be in the same monastery right, as this woman from who knows where. They had, a, they had both traverse the Pacific, right, from Asia to Mexico to end up in this place. We know that the sale was for 800 pesos, so that's 50 more pesos than the original sale, probably in relation to the price of Gonzalo, right, but that still means that the main price weight is carried by Juliana, right? Juliana, who is now younger, 33, is being priced as being the person who will reproduce more labor. And after this point, it's, it's four documents. Uh, we lose track of Juliana's steps. We can surmise that they became part of the household of the new slave owner, who was also a widow. Uh, Magda, uh, her name was Magdalena Reyes de Villafuerte. So she went from once being in the household of one widow to living in a monastery, from primarily male space, to once again living in the household of another widow. I want to turn off the picture because it's such a wonderful engraving. Someday, I'll write out Juliana's life story. I am inspired by the contributors to this edited collection that I'm doing, based on the four documents I shared with you and related materials. We do historical biography by using everything that is at our disposal. Um, I know that it'll be a biography of a woman whose experiences were, of course, shaped by gender as were the lives of the two women who purchased her, right? In, in the four documents, the woman who sold Juliana to the friar and also the woman who, who bought her and three of her children. In this regard, Juliana's biography will also be about women as active participants in the reproduction of patriarchal relations. So in the abstract for today's symposium, Nefefti 
urged us to think about the, quote, centrality of gender in the making and conceiving of regions, end quote. I think that biographies like the one um, that I propose for Juliana might open a window into thinking about putting gender analysis at the center of reconceptualizing regions. So my example is that Juliana and her children and Gonzalo, they lived in this global capital, right? They lived in Mexico City. Mexico City was a slave society in the 17th century, meaning that the institution of slavery determined social relations and buttressed the economy, much as every other large city in the Americas. And if you look at the engraving, you know, in some ways, I know that many of you know this, but um, <coughs> we, and, until maybe about 20 years ago, we had never studied Afro-Mexico. Okay. It used to be a very different narrative. But in engravings, we see that it is people with black skin who are doing all the hard labor. And in my research, I have recovered the lives of people who didn't cl cross the Atlantic, but they crossed the Pacific also as um, chattel property. Now, among historians, and I think that's something that we've talked about earlier today, decolonization usually refers to the dissolution of European empires and the aftermath of colonialism in the 20th century. The phrase decolonizing history, um, on the other hand, has a much broader scope in terms of time and space. Uh, in terms of early modern history, I'm much more of an early modernist. Decolonizing <laughs> history means, for example, upending the traditional narrative that says that Spaniards conquered Mexico. They conquered all of Latin America, if you didn't know. And successfully colonized its vast territory for 300 years. That is a narrative. My decolonizing narrative says that Spaniards only wielded sovereignty over a number of urban centers, like Mexico City, where enslaved people from Asia and Africa were often in the majority. Okay. Outside of these cities, i.e. in the rest of Mexico, indigenous people maintained their independence to varying degrees. And I can say that as well for places like Peru, Argentina, Colombia. Five Spaniards wielded some political control in capital cities. So ethno historians are now writing this decolonized history using indigenous language documents, which we really didn't used to use because nobody learned indigenous languages which I can tell you tell a very different story than that of Spanish domination. And in this rewriting of indigenous Latin America and black Latin America and Asian Latin America, women um, and gendered relations are much more at the center of our analysis. So to end, let me say that in reconstructing these people's lives, somebody like Juliana who I found the four documents over the course of a year and a half worth of research. Um, it does take a certain perseverance to see the colonial archive, uh, but it is only by, by writing these stories that we can have different conceptions um, that talk about decolonized spaces around the world. So I've, I've asked our um, wonderful participants to, to um, if they, to give them a, a, a little bit of uh, time to um, engage each other if they would like, and then I think we would like to open it up to questions from the audience. We just open it yeah. up. Yeah? We, just we don't open have it up? a lot of time. So yeah. Okay. Yeah. Because we get to chat over dinner. That's so. true. All right. So um, if there are um, any questions, um, immediate questions. If we don't, we can ask each other. <laughs> <laughs> well, that was suddenly surprising because I just said in the beginning that we you would talk first. So everybody, you know, let's just give everybody a little time to ask their question. I think perhaps what maybe that 
I would like to um, focus a little bit is in the ways that you um, all uh, talked about kinship and uh, creative forms of um, making kinship or what the role of kinship was in uh, how do we think about kinship with, um, in the face of um, the, the pressures and denials and impediments toward kinship, you know, what, ki uh, what kind of analytical uh, purchase can, um, can we take from thinking about the way in particular that um, women um, created forms of kinship um, or invented forms of kinship and how does that help us perhaps um, provide other stories uh, or think differently about the history in which um, we think about slavery. That's just a, just a general, I was just struck by that all of you mentioning um, kinship because it also has to do with how we think about um, you know, the role of social reproduction, the, the role of how, whether it's the reproduction of institutions like slavery or institutions like um, uh, um, domination or colonialism or uh, patriarchal institutions versus other kinds of reproduction, which you seem to be suggesting mm -hmm. in the idea of you know, these things that bypass, think, Andrew mentioned bypassing lineages, and there was also, I think, Jessica talked about, you know, the creative forms of kinship that were invented, and um, and I think you also touched on the, the forms of kinship that <coughs> either persisted or were invented in the course of survival. Uh, and, um, well, if I may, I think one of the questions that I had for the, the two of you, I have had the pleasure of reading your book, so I, I had a little more sense of what you were talking about is, while I applaud, um, and I'm going to ask a slightly polemical question, is, uh, but I am very interested in it, is while I applaud what you're saying <coughs> about, and I agree with your kinship story, there's another kinship that's dramatically missing, which is epistemological kinship, which is that we don't have cross conversations across oceanic models of slavery. We don't reflect them in our citational practices, and we don't reflect them in our understanding of kin. So when I was looking at your image, I have seen Chino mm. and Casta in mm. Portuguese archives, but, but Casta means race, because mm. you know that's the early modern, it's at the same time that you're talking about, right? So what would it mean if there were more collaborative readings ac we, across histories of slavery, right, that created a kinship of, of accounts as well? Because I think what we're still doing is recovering uh, materials which are obviously very important and they enlarge in our understanding of what we do, but we are still holding strong to the ways in which we read those objects, right? Mm -hmm. So the, for you to say a property deed mm -hmm. is the formative form, yes it is, but it isn't the property deed, is not the formative form in other, for example, if you look at South Africa, right. or right? So, so the question is not to erase or diminish the value of anything that we are all doing, but how can we do work that, it, that learns from each other more centrally than in occasions like this, which I'm delighted to be part of. But I, but I am very frustrated about the, uh, the lack of the asymmetry in knowledge formations in terms of people who work in Indian Ocean, Atlantic Ocean, Pacific Ocean, um, right? Um, and, and, it's, and it's important for us to talk about that absence as well, right? So I don't know how to resolve it, I'm just saying it because we're here for that reason. Jessica, did you? Can I add to that before you respond? Just mm -hmm. to, because I think one of the things. That, sorry, Anjali. Just I want to. Because what you talked about, Anjali, in a way, was sort of moving away from a notion of primogenitor. Mm -hmm. And when you think about the question Anjali is raising, is one of the really interesting things. If you look at property transactions, they inevitably organize around a kind of uh, literal uh, kinship chart that's that's um, vertical, right? And what you're asking about is a kind of lateralization of the idea of kinship. And I think everybody's doing it, but if you actually made that part of the historiographic convention, what would it look like? You know, I have been um, trying to keep <laughs> The recovery part, I think, has made it so that so much work is required to recover. Quite. When nobody has ever heard the story that getting to the next level 
in some ways I have thought will come for the next generation. <laughs> and I would, um, I think that we maybe have to be more brave in the kind of research that we do. Um, and not just think about recovery, but think about the significance of similar patterns of survival. That would be one way that I would want to think about it. What would it mean um, <coughs> for a woman with four children to try to keep her family in different legal and social milieus? Um, again, I think that like other kind of good history, it requires um, collaboration between people who have different specialties. Um, and that is something that I know that you're much more interdisciplinary than I am, but I was definitely trained to be a historian. So when I, it is already a lot to write with another historian. <laughs> <laughs> to think about writing and collaborating with somebody like, say, anthropology is, uh, wow. Um, so I have been putting it off until I'm a full professor, but I am, I am on it in terms of thinking about what we need to do. Um, no, I mean, the reason why I said the Chino, because the Chinos that appear in the same time period in the Portuguese, in the, in the, in the, in Lisboa, in Lisbon, are migrants. Mm -hmm. and, they're, and they're, they're, they're from the same right. area. And Sanjay Subramaniam, for example, writes about that history, but he's writing about the same people who are migrants, consensual mm -hmm. migrants, are mark, and also slaves. Mm -hmm. So there are, two, there are two Chinos existing side by side. <laughs> So sometimes when I see that term, I, I want to, in your case, it's marked as slave. But yeah. what if you just saw Chino? It wouldn't normally ostensibly lead to slave. It would, could lead to other genealogies mm -hmm. of arrival, which are not about slavery mm -hmm. as well. So that was super interesting. Economic for me. migration. Yeah, it was yeah. Yeah. which is as old as, you know. So it was interesting for me to see that. But mm -hmm. thank you. So, so in the book, um, in Practicing Freedom, one of the stories I follow, and it's still an Atlantic story, is of, of a woman who, um, in 18th century Senegal is um, essentially, a, not essentially, is a slave owner. Mm -hmm. um, and so Senegal, West Africa is a world in which we talk about slavery as, um, as a loss of kin, as um, not having a sort of composite freedom on the other side. But in looking at her community, what we also see are the ways that if we think of like the ocean as a metaphor um, for both how archives are, are getting created and also how histories are, um, elaborated upon or events unfold, um, you have different shores and different waterways actually meeting. So you have what becomes chattel slavery in the Atlantic side meeting a different kind of notions of bondage, of, of peonage, of pawnship, of, of kin and, and alienation on the other side. Um, and these women um, get caught in sort of uh, the messiness of that. And so this woman in particular gets caught because she ends up across the Atlantic through all kinds of means. Interesting. Um, and there, and you can actually see her change in the archive. Um, and so on Senegal's side, she has a full name, first name and surname. She has property, she has a husband. On the ship, she is just named as um, uh, a free mulatresse. She arrives on the other side of the Atlantic. She happens to have a white husband. Um, and she's his husband. So there's no designation in the, in the archive in Louisiana that she is even a woman. Well, there was a little bit of designation that she's a woman of African descent for reasons that are in the book <laughs> that will come out. <laughs> um, but uh, so there's, it's really interesting, that, that question, because you can see the way that the archives actually structures the way we can even see people as they cross um, spaces, as they cross oh, time sure. and space, they cross mm -hmm. slaveholding societies. Um, and so in some ways, there are ways that we end up like having to be promiscuous, as I was suggesting, um, about where we engage in our research, where we, um, who we call kin, and how we think about that. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, and then also sort of, you know, to the extent that we can, let some of our subjects sort of guide us into the stories that, um, that they are trying to tell. Um, but I also find it interesting, it, for me there's also a way that some of these, um, so there's sort of like a kind of horizontal, way that different events are happening at the same time. And then there's also the kind of the impact of um, North African slavery on West African slaveholding complex, sure. Islamic slavery and what's happening in Senegal and um, different states in within Senegal 
um, what becomes Senegambia, um, sort of rebelling and creating different visions of freedom um, and the massaging of that, not freedom as we think about it on this side of the Atlantic, but a, a opposite to slavery, um, the ways that has ripple effects for thinking about French interaction on the coast and the extent to which they can even, you know, how far they can even enter into the mainland because Africans are like new. Um, French understandings on the other side of the Atlantic, the French in, um, engagement with um, indigenous forms of bondage and, 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 um, and sexualities and how they're understanding those and try and co-opt those and commodify those. So all of these end up also having their own kind of historical process where each begins to influence each other. So for me, it's not just sort of seeing kinships that happen laterally, but also the ways that they also are also at the same time building vertically on each other. Um, and we have not worked out in mm -hmm. histories of slavery how to do that at the same time. Like we have not figured out how to be multimodal and three-dimensional in the ways that these histories actually probably require us to mm -hmm. do, and we're still trying to do that. In history. Uh, I'm actually in Spanish class. I'm teasing you because <laughs> I was looking at <laughs> 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 the worst. Yeah. They keep asking me about why We're I can't write history. We're all historians, so, unfortunately. Anyway. Um, but I, I'm trying to take very seriously these ideas that I'm trying to look at slavery both in the Pacific and the Atlantic. Mm -hmm. um, in the years of like 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, 23, 24, 25. But one of the things that comes up as I'm trying to bring these bisected historiographies together is we often end up start talking in comparative terms like pretty quickly. And I'm also trying to think through how, how I put my comparisons together and what assumptions I am working out of um, as, I, as I compare to two different places. I don't know if that makes sense. Um, how I think it's important to think through why I'm pairing two places together and what, what that pairing might assume that's maybe not obvious on the, on the surface. But I was just kind of wondering if you have thoughts on how to think through uh, this impulse to compare as we bring bisexual historiographies Well, I think in terms of comparative slavery, mm -hmm. right, I mean, there is a whole, like a historiographical lineage of us wanting to do comparative slavery. Mm -hmm. um, I think that we have a little bit done comparative, right, in some ways, and what um, she's, what we're calling for, which I think is the more of the wave of the future, mm -hmm. is to not so much compare, but to see similarities in different spaces, because the similarities, regardless of slightly different legal structures and different forms of bondage, whether it's chattel property or um, bonded labor, one of the similarities does seem to be kind of patriarchal asymmetry, and the experience of women is always very different. So I would kind of urge you to be um, maybe look more for the similarities in these two different systems as opposed to looking at, like comparing in the different than, than, than this, yeah, yeah. I think f my relationship to V would be more epistemological, which right. is to ask how does the object come into view? If your object is slavery or your object is property, how does that object become rendered visible? Through what grids of intelligibility does it become an object? that then we can recognize as slavery, right? This is a work that people who work on Islam and religion, Talal Asad has written about. So that you have to, if there are any graduate students, my only advice would you please read outside your discipline yeah. and read outside your narrow interests because that's really what comparative work is about. It's not about two objects that may or may not belong to each other. It's about asking why do these objects um, begin to hold forth at all? So uh, my, that would be my suggestion, not knowing any more about what you're saying in terms of content. Mm -hmm. But I would say that it would, it, for me, it's always an epistemological question because I'm never going to know as much as, as my, my esteemed colleagues on this panel. What I can learn from there are ways of reading the objects that I know are familiar to me and how to undo the familiar form, right? So, yeah. I would continue with that. Um, 
how do we know, if, we're, if it's comparative slavery or um, diaspora, how do you know someone is a slave? How do you know that they're enslaved? How do you know that they are race, black or African or Chino, whatever it may be? How do you know they're a woman? Like we're just actually getting to the question of how do you know that they're a woman in historiographies of slavery? We're just beginning to trouble that. Um, but those get, end up getting the kind of questions that if you spin the history around or the archive around that question, you actually get some really interesting answers that can get you in, I think, across um, historiographies. And also, you know, respecting the other historiographies of which people have had long, dense histories, like in a place. And that's also very important, too. to think about because when we're thinking of, across these different spaces and you know like a very common debate would be when does something <coughs> a condition become you know slavery versus indentured because there's so much overlap in the system and in my I know very well the case of Brazil is that pro-slavery advocates use that ambiguity to continue their agenda, you know, to continue the kinds of labor practices that they wanted to maintain the agricultural economy. So even in that ambiguity, it, you know, it, it, it tells you a lot about what the history of the time. So when we're debating, oh, what, this is indenture now, what does that mean? Um, a lot of the times I'm thinking about, well, who is, who's, who's in it? Who is it, you know, what, what does that kind of argument show you about the stakes of who's in it, you know, like the abolitionist, the pro-slavery advocate, they're, uh, they're, you know, advocating for these kinds of terms. So it's a really interesting ambiguity to think about, and even mm -hmm. in our own debates about, you know. Sure. Sure. I mean, people have, I mean, so when we walk into the archive, I mean, depending, um, and this, sometimes it's, it really is, again, it's like speaking horizontally and also vertically at the same time. There are points, the 18th century conversations about bondage and slavery are different from the 14th and 15th century conversations and are different from the 19th century conversations. The, it's why people talk about there's a kind of second slavery for Brazil and for, um, for the Cuba. South Atlantic, right? It's why the South Atlantic African diaspora looks very, very different from the early Caribbean and from the 18th century moment. Um, so the extent to which people are both adding indenture in different places to a conversation to, tr to, to get away from talking about slavery or have begun with, with conversations about indenture and that evolves into what becomes chattel slavery. Um, those will mark you also in time as well as place. But horizontally, that also may shift in really interesting ways. So where it becomes um, a system of bondage or uh, a system of slavery that is more focused on women um, and performance and intimate work, sex work, um, hospitality labor, those kinds of things, that also has a kind of um, comparative dimension uh, that may uh, get us into and across and out of sort of like our regions, right? So if we think about where and when um, the sign, the object slave comes in, we actually may be able to get into a to a more rich uh, comparative discussion where the question of indentured labor comes in and where the sign of blackness also comes in because that is such a, um, a dense material to it and ends up configuring so many things in that particular moment and in our historiography that we can not actually shy away from it. So we're talking about slavery, are we talking about racial slavery, are we talking about African slavery, are we talking about something else, are we talking about indenture, is it, um, Free, is, it, is it free blacks? Is it Africans on the West African coast? Are we, talk, are we back in Atlantic Creoles? Like, we actually have to get really, really specific um, if we're going to, if we're gonna do this comparative work. Um, it can't be, it can't be, it has to be epistemological and it can't be, but it can also can't be at the level of abstra abstra abstraction too far. We have to like also be very based in people's material realities because at that level, the experience that somebody has who has been signed and marked as black is going to be very particular, and that may change depending on indenture, labor, and slavery, but that also will come with its own history that you know, runs in a circle into different, um, different times and spaces. Can I just? Yes. Oh, I'm I, I just want to throw it a, a point. A, a little, like, yeah. 
the coin is rolling, I want to stop it for a second. Because one of the things, it's really interesting to think, I mean, one of the things that we have to think about is contracts, right? So if you look at contracts in Surat, in which is the port in um, Tanzania, a little bit sort of close to where I'm going to point it, um, in the 16th, 17th century, what's really interesting is um, sa sailors actually who are trying to sign contracts, and they include African sailors, they include Gujarati sailors, they include Maharashtra sailors, they include Portuguese sailors, um, are actually trying to sign contracts with the Dutch um, company, right? And it's specifically what's interesting about those contracts is that they understand that there are two different forms of contractual uh, you know, kind of uh, bondage, if you will. And one of them is a slave, is literally a form of this. It is a form of contractual bondage, a form of sale. And the other is breast gaining, which is white people, right? And so they're explicitly trying to write a contract that conveys both those forms, right? So I think, I mean, I, I'm. I'm trying to be specific, but if you actually think about the epistemology of the contract, which I think everybody is, and I'm sure you started with it, you know, what does that, uh, that form allow us to rethink in relation, I mean, the Dutch are tr transacting, you know, are carrying black bodies, but on, in the Surat, in, in Surat, African uh, sailors are actually negotiating something different from Dutch ship captains, knowing that they could be this other kind of body, right? So, you know, what does that, so it's actually really interesting to look at labor contracts. Right? Um, the, the problem with what we were talking about is that they're not labor contracts, right? They're bills of sale, they're the so person has no control over what is happening. No, I understand, but I, I actually know for the economic history. Mm -hmm. And the thing is, what I'm saying is that these same people understand that they the could become yes. a mm -hmm. bill of sale. Yes, absolutely. Sure, right? absolutely. And not just a bill of sale, they also understand press gaming, which is for white people, primarily, which is actually means that you get shit food. I mean, it's very specific. It's about food, it's about money. It's about if you are taken somewhere, you have to be brought back, so that you cannot be bought. For example, in the in Indonesia, yeah, no, right? So there's a so you can't be turned into mm -hmm. a chino. So it's it's very interesting. Mm -hmm. So it's so we separate the bill of sale from the labor contract, mm -hmm. and I want us to understand that people were actually un negotiating, negotiating labor labor contracts through a very acute understanding of the place of the bill of sale. Yeah. I don't think we I don't think we separate them though. No, yeah. we often yeah. do I mean we do in yeah. certain situations. I'm just oh, yeah. sort of No 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 but I think that's yeah. an excellent example of how we need to actually talk about those kinds yeah. of documents in exactly that way. <laughs> like those are documents that are created that are actually in a relationship and it can ship with each other. Yeah. Um, which is lateral. Mm -hmm. Or can which be is logical. also whatever. yeah, it's it's, it's, it's both actually. I, well, and when I'm hearing you talk about it, I hear it as both. I hear it as both in a tradition of the Dutch doing a particular kind of slave trading. I hear it as Africans trying to um, make clear who they're not, which is also a kind of form of relation that is mm -hmm. um, a rejection. Like that's still like to to um, to reject. You have to either fear the consequences of a relation or understand that there is a relational possibility there. And um, yeah, like, so there's a lot. So I see it, I, what I see is like on see what you're describing as all those dimensions that is exactly the kind of work that we can be doing. And while these documents need to be um, juntos, they need to be together. Yeah. They, need to, they need to be in conversation with each other. Yeah. Um, can I just yeah. Um, yeah, add for one sure. thing, and then we'll collect a, a last round of uh, comments. And I, I was actually interested in this in, in your approach to the archives. I mean, knowing, I mean, all of you were um, very clear about how you saw the archive as an active force, right? I mean, this is, the new, this is um, some of the, the, the very important work that has come with the, about the, the active force that um, the archives uh, you know, play. Uh, but what, what are your um, ways, you know, if you could think 
you know, more um, more explicitly about the methods by which you are, are reading the archives in a way that takes into account their active force in. Oh, for sure. Yeah. 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 So that 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 would be my question, and then let's just take a couple more, and then you can answer them in any way. Yes. Um, and I, uh, going off of what you asked about, uh, you know, I thought um, in a way the bill of sale come labor contract that you quoted, Anjali, was trying, you know, because it wasn't just that she was sold for 50 rupees, but it came with a contractual Quite. Uh, sort of uh, part to what was expected of her. But there is a really interesting twist that happens at the end when she, you know, there's, um, I couldn't but be uh, focused on this idea of value that all of you were talking about. You know, value through bills of sale. Val my value, my name. Mm -hmm. After she lists all the properties that are of value. And then she sort of turns it around and brings these different notions uh, of, of value together. Um, you know, there's an interesting <coughs> thing. There's a, a sort of thread of value in each of uh, your work um, coming from very different places. And I think one of the things you're also, we're also talking about is the value of the archive itself. Um, what we value, how we're taught to value, what happens when there is no archive and you have to sort of create one, or what happens when there is a proliferation, as in your case, when much of what exists is fiction. Quite. Yeah. Right? And then what kinds of practices of of reading uh, are required, mm -hmm. the bills of sales that you mentioned, which are very stark, mm -hmm. that are valuing human being, beings, but how do they create a valuable mm -hmm. archive as, as a living force, etc. Mm -hmm. um, this bill of sale, this contract mm -hmm. that you mentioned, which sort of writes Teres out completely, and yet, how do you presence her? The presencing of something. Um, I don't know. These are just sort of jumble of thoughts, but things that occurred to me. Maybe I could answer your question and Anu's question mm -hmm. together, and then I'll let, let uh, my two colleagues have the final word. I think your question about the active archive for me is linked to the question of value, mm -hmm. right? So, and I wanted to use my comments as a way to also call on Jessica's expertise in, as she is a digital humanist. Mm -hmm. um, is so uh, f um, in the spirit of anthropology, I'll use an ethnographic event. Um, so one of the, uh, the, the uh, <coughs> struggles I've had with this archive is, as I've, many people here have heard some versions, uh, pieces and parts of this work, because I've been doing it for a while, is that the material is falling apart, mm -hmm. right? As I, you know, it's, there's massive amounts of material, but it's, and those of us who are trained in history in some conventional mm -hmm. ways, the, the thing is it's falling apart, right? So one of the things I've been trying to do is to say, why don't you digitalize these materials to, the, uh, to this, this collectivity because they now have some resources, et cetera, and they're not interested in digitalizing. Now, ordinarily, this could be read as a we don't give a shit about our lives, our past, or we don't have the money, right? In this case, they do have the resources, and they definitely give a damn about their history because they produce this massive archive. Mm -hmm. So what's the refusal of digitalization about? So eventually, they, after I harassed them for years, they said, okay, okay, fine, we'll give you the money, digitalize. And then I thought, why do I want to digitalize? To what end, right? And for them, digitalization is uninteresting in the ways that they articulate it because they're not invested in preservation, right? The archive for them is not a place of preservation. It's a place of imaginative entry and belonging. So that's why, I mean, I begin my book with this event of Make Believe, where they say you, you can make whatever you want of this. You can believe whatever you want. We just have to continue producing. <laughs> so the archive is active in a way that is not confined to brick and mortar, but it's also an epistemological form where um, you know, one could digitalize, but then it becomes a conventional form. Right, so I'm not sure. I, it's you know, it still freaks me out that they don't want to digitalize these materials. But it is an interesting challenge to give up that demand to say, well, these materials are really valuable. I want the young scholars I'm training to be able to read these mm. materials. What if they're gone? Mm. But what if they are not interested in? And in, in what do we do with that? Which is also very counterintuitive, right? Okay. So the value of reproduction and preservation and reparation is so sutured to our understanding of the archive, right? So what happens? when we have to let that go. So I, I'll just say that. Thank you. Mm. Last comments from yes. Yeah. Um, 
<laughs> uh, okay, I'll try to, I, I guess I can try to bring both. I think that, gosh, that's hard. <laughs> Um, so the question, like the question of the contract, I mean, it's interesting that this is this is where we are, sort of ended up thinking about contracts and um, how they structure structured at the time, um, what the relations might be, and structure for us now what we can understand about those relations. I mean, it, it goes back to, in some ways, um, trying to bring it into active force of the archive. <coughs> I guess one of the things I can think about uh, is a contract like the one that Mingo signs is is a contract. So it's not a bill of sale in the same way that um, Julieta mm -hmm. is engaging in, is being engaged in and appearing in the archive of bill of sale. And yet that as appears in almost a similarly transactional way. There's limits to that because she does like in like the contract is also a marriage contract. So it's like a labor contract that's also a manumission document that's also a marriage contract at the same time. Um, and so there's ways that even the documents that we're talking about are actually promiscuous themselves. And so we've got to catch up to them. Um, but within those, we have like two women, Julieta and, and Teresa, that can sort of become legible. And the woman, give me sorry, her name. Um, it, uh, Vimla, Vimla, is Vimla. Easy. Vimla, Vimla. So is all of them, in some remember. ways, appear in this transactional moment that where they are asking, being d demanded of certain kind of labor. Um, maybe someone is making demands of them, um, and as part of the exchange, there are certain terms that are being set. Um, so I guess one way to think about it is this: there's a force to the archive that you know in the finding aid and the structure of the archive and the imperial construction of where the box and folio is, that we come to it and we think that that's what it is. But what if instead these are all actually negotiations around the terms of somebody's state of being and we have to confront and grapple with that? What if these three women are actually more similar in their state than we are sort of accepting that they are? What can we get out of seeing in them and those similarities and their experience as female, as, um, Femme as uh, sexualized in a particular way, as non-white or non-master, whatever we want to think about that, that can actually help us to put them in a particular kind of relation in which that that label of contract on the box doesn't structure as much of how we understand them, and yet um, tells us something about that value piece that is so that is so so important when we're looking at sexuality and um, female bodied people, female ascribed people in the archive. Sorry, that was a roundabout that tried to, I don't know. Thank you, that's very good. Very, both very good questions. So last time we get to talk, um, also last comments. <laughs> um, I think I want to end it with a methodological call for more people to be engaged in this work. Um, taking it to the next level means that more of these bodies mm -hmm. spend time in the archive, whatever archive you can find. Um, and when you go, you know, once, once you become professionalized and you go and there are five of you who are invested in these stories, then it does kind of get to be a little bit, um, get tired, right? So for those of you who are still in graduate school or undergraduates, to commit to changing the narrative. You know, I think it's to doing this kind of decolonizing history and writing a different way of understanding the past is, is really important. Um, we can all, some, we, we take different paths. Some of us are a little bit more old fashioned than others, but um, we just need more bodies <laughs> in, this, in this activity, right, of recovering. Not recovering, thinking, you know, in different um, different levels. So that's I think that's where I would like us to end. On that note, la lucha continúa. La lucha. <laughs> 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 <laughs>